Well, good day and welcome back to the Cube as we continue our segment featuring AWS Startup Showcase. And we're with now Mike Bilodeau, who is in corporate development and operations at Kong. Mike, uh, thank you for joining us here on the Cube and particularly on the Startup Showcase. Nice to have you and Kong represented here today. Thanks for having me, John. Great to be here. You bet. All right. First off, let's just tell us about Kong a little bit and and uh, Kong Connect, which I know is your your featured program uh, or um, service. Uh, I love the name, by the way. Um, but tell us a little bit about Kong and then what Connect is all about. Too. Sure. So uh, Kong as a company really came about in the past five years. Uh, our two co-founders came over from Italy in uh, in the late in the late aughts, early to, uh, twenty teens. And uh, had a company called Mashade. And so what they were looking at and what they were betting on at that time was that APIs uh, were going to be the future of how software was built and uh, how developers interacted with software. And so what came from that was a, a piece of, uh, they were running Mashade as a marketplace at the time. So connecting developers to different APIs so that they can consume them and use them to build new software. And what they found was that actually the most valuable piece of technology that they had created was the backbone for running that marketplace. And that backbone is what Kong is. And so they created it to be able to handle a massive amount of traffic, a massive amount of APIs all simultaneously. This is a problem that a lot of enterprises have, especially now that we've started to get to microservices, uh, started to, to have more distributed technologies. And so what Kong is really is it's a way to manage all of those different APIs, all of the connections between different microservices uh, through a single platform, which is Kong Connect. And now that we've started to have Kubernetes, uh, the sort of the, the birth and the, the nascent space of service mesh, Kong Connect allows all of those connections to be managed and to be secured and made reliable uh, through a single platform. So what's driving this, right? I mean, um, you, you mentioned microservices um, and, and Kubernetes and, and that environment, which is kind of facilitating, you know, this, uh, I guess, transformation, you might say. Um, but but what, what's the big driver, in your opinion, in terms of, of what's pushing this microservices phenomenon, if you will, or this revolution? Sure. And when I think it starts out at, at the simple fact of, of technology acceleration in general. Um, so when you look at just the, the real shifts that have come in enterprise tech, uh, especially looking, you know, start with that at the cloud, but you could even go back to, to VMware and, and virtualization, is it's really about allowing people to build software more rapidly. Um, all of these different innovations that have happened, you know, with cloud, with virtualization, now with containers, Kubernetes, microservices, they're really focused on making it uh, so that developers can build software a lot more quickly, uh, develop the, the, the latest and greatest in a more rapid way. I think that a, a huge driver out of this is just making it easier for developers, for organizations to bring new technologies to market. Uh, and we see that as a kind of a key driver in a lot of these decisions that are being made. I think another piece of it that's really coming about is Looking at uh, security uh, as a, a really big component, you know, if you have a, a huge monolithic app, uh, it can become very challenging to actually secure that. If somebody gets into kind of that initial uh, into the the initial app space, they're really past the point of no return and, and can get access to some things that you might not want them to. Similar for compliance and governance reasons, that becomes challenging. So I think you're seeing this combination of where. Uh, people are looking at breaking things into smaller pieces, even though it it does come with its own challenges around security um, that you need to manage. It's making it so that uh, there's less ability to just get in and, and cause a lot of damage kind of all at once uh, for malicious, malicious attackers. Yeah, you bring up security. And, and so, yeah, to me, it's almost in some cases, it's almost counterintuitive. I think about I've got the, if I got this monolithic app and, and I've got a big perimeter around it, right? And I know that I can confine this thing. I can contain this. This is good. Now, microservices, now I got a lot of, it's almost like a lot of villages, right? They're all around. And, and uh, I don't have the castle anymore. I've got all these villages. So I have to build walls around all these villages, right? 
but you're saying that there that's actually easier to do, or at least you're more capable of doing that now, as right. opposed to maybe where we were two, three years ago. Well, you, you can almost think of it uh, as if you have those villages, right? And you might, um, if you have one castle and somebody gets inside, they're going to be able to find whatever treasure you may have, you know, to extend the analogy here a bit. But now if you have 50 different, uh, 50 different villages that, you know, uh, an attacker needs to look in, it starts to become really time consuming and really difficult. And now when you're looking at, especially this idea of kind of cybersecurity, um, the ability to secure a monolithic app is typically not all that different from what you can do with a microservice or with uh, once you get past that initial point. Instead of thinking of it as, you know, I have my one wall around everything, you now think of it almost as a series of walls where it gets more and more difficult. Again, this all depends on uh, that you're, you're managing that security well, which can get really time consuming more than anything else. Uh, and challenging from a pure management standpoint, but from an actual security posture, uh, it is a way of where you can strengthen it uh, because you're you're creating more um, more difficult ways of, of accessing information for attackers, as well as just more layers potentially of security that they need to. Get. So, what do you do to lift that burden then from from the customer? Because, like you said, that that that's a concern they really don't want to have right they want they want you to do that they want somebody to do that for them so what can, what do you do to alleviate those kinds of stresses on their systems yeah uh, it's a great question and this is really where the idea of api management um, in its in its infancy came from was thinking about uh, how do we abstract away these different tasks that people don't really want to do when they're managing uh, how API, how people can interact with their APIs, whether that be a, a device or, or another human. Um, and part of that is just taking away. So what we do and what API get management tools have always done is abstract that into a, a new piece of software. So instead of having to kind of individually develop and write code for security, for logging, for you know, routing logic, all these different pieces of how those different APIs will com communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. We're putting that into a single piece of software and we're allowing that to be done in a, a really easy way. And so what we've done now with ConConnect and where we've extended that to is making it even easier to do that at a microservices level of scale. So if you're thinking about hundreds or thousands of different microservices that you need to really understand, and be able to manage, that's what we're really building to allow people to do. And so that comes with you know, being able to, to make it extremely easy uh, to, to actually add policies like authentication, you know, rate limiting, whatever it may be, as well as giving people the choice to use what they want to use. Uh, we have great partners you know, looking at the, the data dogs, the octas of the world, who provide a, a pretty pretty incredible product. We don't necessarily want to reinvent the wheel on some of these things that are already out there and that are widely loved and accepted by uh, technology practitioners and developers. We just want to make it really easy to actually use those uh, those different technologies. And so that's, that's a lot of what we're doing is providing a, a way to make it easy to add this, you know, these policies and this logic into each one of these different services. So if you're providing these kinds of services, right, and, 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 and they're, they're, they're new, right, um, and you're merging them sometimes with kind of legacy uh, components, um, that transition or that interaction, I, I would assume, could be a little complex. And, and you've, you've got your work cut out for you in some regards to kind of retrofit, right, in some respects, to make this seamless, to make this smooth. So maybe shine a little light on that process in terms of not throwing all the, you know, the bath out, you know, with, 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 the, with the baby, all the water here, but just making sure it all works, right? And that it makes it simple and, and um, takes away that kind of complexity that people might be facing. Yeah, that's really the name of the game. Uh, we, we do not believe that there is a one-size-fits-all uh, approach in general to how people should build software. Uh, there are going to be instances of where building a monolithic app makes the most sense. There are going to be instances of where building on Kubernetes makes the most sense. 
Um, the key thing that we want to solve is making sure that it works and that you're able to, to make the best technical decision for your product and for your organization. Mm-hmm. And so in looking at uh, sort of how we help to solve that problem, I think the first is that we have first class support for everything. So we support, you know, everything down to, to kind of the oldest bare metal servers, to VMs, to containers across the board. Uh, and, and we've had that mindset with every product that we've brought to market. So thinking about our service mesh, for, in, for instance, um, Kuma is the open source project that underpins now our, our enterprise one. But looking at Kuma, one of the first things that we did when we brought it out, because we saw this gap in the space, was to make sure that it had first-class support for virtual machines. At the time, that wasn't something that was commonly done at all. Uh, now, you know, there, there's more people are moving in that direction because they do see it as a need, which is great for the space. Um, but that's something where we we understand that the important thing is making sure, to your point, you, you said it kind of the exact way that, that we like to, which is it needs to be reliable. It needs to work. So I have a, a huge estate of you know, older app applications, older, uh, you know, potentially environments, even I might have data centers, I might have cloud being trying to do everything all at once isn't really a pragmatic approach. Always. It needs to be able to support the journey as you move to, to a more modern way of building. So in terms of going from on-premise to the cloud, running in a hybrid approach, whatever it may be, all of those things shouldn't be an all or nothing proposition. It should be a phased approach and moving to, to really where it makes sense for your business and, and for the specific product. You know, we've been talking about cloud deployments, obviously AWS comes into play there you know, in, a, in a major way for you guys. Um, tell me a little bit about that, about how you're leveraging that relationship and, and how you're partnering with them and then bringing the, the value then to your customer base. And, Kind of how long that's been going on and, and the kinds of work that you guys are doing together uh, ultimately to provide this kind of uh, exemplary product or at least options to your customers. Yeah, of course. I think the, the way that we're doing it first and foremost is that um, we, we know exactly who AWS is in the space and, and you know a great number of our customers are running on AWS. So again, I think that first class support in general for AWS environments, services, uh, both from the the container service, their their con- Kubernetes services, everything that they can have and that they offer to their customers, we want to be able to support. Uh, one of the first areas of, of really that comes to mind in terms of uh, first class integration and support is thinking about Lambda and serverless. Um, so at the time when we first came out with that, again, it was early for us uh, or early in our journey as product and as company, uh, but really early for the space. And so how we were able to support that and how we were able to see uh, that it could support our vision and, and what we wanted to bring as a value proposition to the market has been, you know, really powerful. So I think in looking at, you know, how we work with AWS, certainly on a, a partnership level of where we share a lot of the same customers, we share a, a very similar ethos in wanting to help people do things in the most cost-effective rapid manner possible and to build the best software. Uh, and, you know, I mean, for us, we, we have a, a little bit of, of uh, backstory with, with AWS because Jeff Bezos was a, an early investor in, in Kong. Uh, <laughs> that didn't hurt, did it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the whole memo that he wrote about, uh, you know, build an API or, or you're fired was, was certainly an inspiration to, to us. And, you know, just, it, it catalyzed, uh, so much change in, in the technology landscape in general about how everyone viewed APIs about building uh, software that could be reused and, and was composable. And so that's something that, you know, we, we look at kind of carrying forward and, and we've been building on that momentum ever since. So let's just kind of take, a again, a high-level look at this in terms of microservices and how that's changing in terms of cloud connectivity. I think you actually have a graphic, too, that maybe we can pull up and take a look at this. And, and let's talk about this evolution, you know, what's occurring here a little bit. And, and as we take a look at this, um, tell us what you think those these impacts are at the end of the day for your customers and how they're better able to provide their services and satisfy their customer needs. Absolutely. So this is really the heart 
of the the Connect platform and of our vision in general. Um, we'd spoken just a minute ago about thinking how we can support the entire journey or uh, the the enterprise reality that is managing a, a relatively complex environment of monoliths, different services, microservices, you know, serverless functions, whatever it may be, uh, as well as lots of different deployment methods and underlying tech platforms. You know, if you have uh, virtual machines and Kubernetes, whatever, again, whatever it may be. But what we look at is just the, the different sort of uh, design patterns that can occur in thinking about a monolithic application. Um, okay, mainly that's an edge concern of thinking about how you're going to handle connectivity coming in from the edge. In looking at a Kubernetes environment of where you're going to have, you know, many Kubernetes clusters that need to be able to communicate with each other, that's where we start to think about uh, our ingress products and, and Kubernetes ingress that allows for that cross app, uh, cross application communication. And then within the application itself, and looking at service mesh, which we talked a little bit about, of just how do I make sure that I can instrument and, and secure every transaction that's happening in a, a truly microservices uh, deployment um, within Kubernetes or outside of it? How do I make sure that that's reliable and secure? And so what we look at is this is just a uh, part of it is evolution and, and part of it is going to be figuring out what works best when. Um, certainly, if you're, if you're building something from scratch, it doesn't always make sense to build it. Your MVP as you know, microservices running on Kubernetes, it probably makes sense to, to go with the shortest path. Uh, at the same time, if you're trying to run at, at massive scale and big applications and make sure they're as reliable as possible, it very well does make sense to spend the time and the effort to, to make Kubernetes work well for you. And I think that's, that's the, the beauty of, of how the space is shifting is that uh, it's, it's going towards a way of the most practical solution to get towards business value, to, to move software quicker, to give customers the value that they want, to delight them to use Amazon's uh, you know, phraseology, if that's a, if that's a word. Uh, it's, it's something of where you know, that is becoming more and more standard practice versus just trying to, to make sure that you're doing the, the latest and greatest for the sake of, of, uh, of doing it. So we've been talking about customers, you know, in, in rather generic terms, uh, in terms of what you're providing them. We've talked about new services that are certainly uh, providing added value and, and providing them solutions, you know, to their problems. Can you give us maybe just a couple of examples of, of some real life success stories where, where you've had some success in terms of, of providing services that um, I assume um, people needed, or at least maybe they didn't know they needed until uh, you you provided that kind of development. But but give us an idea, maybe just uh, shine a little light on some success that you've had so that people at home, again, watching this, can perhaps relate to that experience and maybe give them a reason to think a little more about Kong and Kong Connect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there, there's a number that come to mind, but certainly one of the, the customers that I spent a lot of time with uh, you know, become almost friends with the with the with the different with a couple of the practitioners who work there is a company called Cargill. Uh, it's a shared one with us in AWS. You know, it's one we've written about in the past, but this is one of the largest companies in the world. Um, and uh, the the way that they describe it is is that if you've ever eaten a McMuffin or eaten from McDonald's and had breakfast there, you you've used a Cargill service because they provide so much of the the food supply chain business and the logistics for it. They had a, uh, it's a, it's an old, you know, it's a century and a half old company. It has a, a really storied kind of legacy and it's grown to be uh, an extremely large company. That's, that's still private. Uh, but you know, they have some of the most unique challenges I think that I I've, I've seen in the space in terms of needing to be able to ensure uh, that they're able to, to kind of move quickly and build a lot of new services and software that touch so many different spaces. So they were, uh, the challenge that was put in front of them was looking at really modernizing, you know, again, a, a century and a half old company, modernizing their entire tech stack. And, you know, we're certainly not all of that in, in any way, shape or form, 
but we are something that can help that process quite a bit. And so as they were migrating to AWS, as they were looking at, you know, creating a CICD process for, for really being able to ship and deploy new software as quickly as possible, as they were looking at how they could distribute the, the new APIs and services that they were building, we were helping them with every piece of that journey. Um, by being able to, to make sure that the services that they deployed uh, performed in the way that they expected them to, we were able to give them a lot of confidence in being able to move uh, more rapidly and, and move a lot of software over from these tried and true, uh, you know, older or, or more legacy ways of doing things to a much more cloud native build. As they were looking at, you know, using Kubernetes uh, in AWS and, and being able to support that to handle scale again, we were something that was able to, to kind of bridge that gap and make sure that there weren't going to be disruptions. So there, there are a lot of kind of great reasons of why their, their numbers really speak for themselves in terms of how, uh, how much velocity they were able to get. You know, they, saying, them, saying them out loud almost sounds fake in some cases um, because they were able to, you know, I think like something, something around the order of 20x, the amount of, of new APIs and services that they were building over a six-month period. Really kind of crazy, crazy numbers. Um, but it, it is something where, you know, the for us, we we got a lot out of them because they were open source users. So Kong is first and foremost an, an open source company. And so they were helping us before they even became paying customers uh, just by testing the software, providing feedback, really putting it through its paces and, and using it at a scale that's really hard to replicate. You know, the scale of a, uh, a couple hundred thousand person company. Right. Yeah. Talk about a win-win. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah that worked out well. Certainly, the proof is in the pudding, and I'm sure that's just one of many examples of success that you had. Uh, we appreciate the time here and certainly the insights, and uh, wish you well on down the road. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. I've been speaking with Mike Bellado uh, from Kong. He is uh, in corporate development and operations there. I'm John Walls, and you're watching on the Cube, the AWS Startup Showcase.